Hey, Chad. Hello. It looks very windy. Wait, where I am? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's uh, it gets windy here, but no, it's actually not too windy at the moment. I can tell you what the wind speed is because I have, I have Prometheus. <laughs> I managed to blag a professional, yeah. like airport I, quality um, uh, weather station. Hi. I, I hope you're using the the GitLab non proprietary fork of of Grafana there. Oh, um, uh, uh, don't want to see any Grafana lab actually, stuff in this call. Actually, I will. Um, I have a I have a very old version of Grafana running way pre-fork because I have an old iPad that I have on a screen and anything more recent than like Grafana 6, the JavaScript doesn't work. So I'm running very old Grafana. Cool. So did you flip your whole excuse. office around too, by the way? Yeah, I did. I did because um, uh, networking and then since I did it, I realized that facing a door where people come in and pat you on the back when you've got noise cancelling headphones on is so much better for your like <laughs> relaxation like rather than having people tap you on your back and getting a fright every single time so i'm right. very happy with the change cool are we i think we're ready to get going eric you had the first item yeah i did a, a i do a periodic one-on-one -on -one with justin and we got a request for architecture which i thought was exciting because um you know we've talked a lot in this room about like we've got a lot of passion and energy from the the staff plus ic ranks to do better architecture and that's what's been driving a lot of this so far um but this is a case where we've got you know business leaders saying like hey we need architecture over here can someone come over and help out um which i thought was great so um uh, the ask would be someone um, to you know contact Jerome and Justin and get in touch with the, the specific engineers and kind of take them through the process. But obviously, we're talking about changing the process, right? So this is an opportunity to kind of like try out some of the new ideas. Like we talked about ensuring that there's an AppSec review, ensuring there's a, there's a product readiness review, whatever else you want to uh, make happen and uh, treat this as an opportunity to blow some smoke through the pipes. And we can do that as well, as opposed to just follow the, the previous or current uh, blueprint process. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to help with that. I have just one question. Is that related to the project Matterhorn, which seems to be a limited access project? Uh, yes, he said fulfillment slash Matterhorn. I'm bad with the code names, so I like I lose <laughs> track of what's what. But I believe that is one that um, may have some MNPI or something like that. So feel free to ask whatever questions you think are necessary for you all yourself. I will. Thank you. And, and well, I'll send the uh, Slack intro to you, Jigorsh, and uh, to Justin and Jerome. Yeah, Jerome would be a great one to follow up with. I think there was also like, a, I don't know if it's already been disbanded, but there was a working group that was related to all that stuff, um, which might be worth getting involved with as well. Can't remember the name of it. I'll link you async if I can find it. Here's your core. Um, let me, I'll, I'll skip down to uh, three and four because they're more relevant to one. Um, Matt Appleman and I are going to retroactively create a blueprint for the um, uh, observability stack that they've been working on based on ClickHouse. Um, I think there's a lot of like juicy aspects to what they've implemented. Um, and I would go as far to say that like it's a it's an interesting um, it's interesting from an architectural perspective because it's like the closest thing to pods I think that we've ever engineered at, at the company. Um, and I think like the uh, their approach to like scheduling various tenants on various clickhouse clusters feels very similar to the type of architecture that we're going to need for 
variety of other components going forward. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for other teams to leverage what they've done, or at least like uh, engage with, with that model. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be working with Matt on that. And then jumping down to three, um, there's a new product analytics section. Um, and the stuff that they're working on, I also think is going to warrant a blueprint. I've posted some links to um, their demo, which is based on a couple open source projects. One of them is Jitsu and the other is um, Cube Dev. I'll type that out. Um, yeah, I, I think this is worth having some more eyes on as well, because like I, I, I've dug pretty deep into both Jitsu and Cube Dev, and I think um, the product analytics team is targeting like a um, like a only supporting self-hosted at first. Like you would run Jitsu and Cube Dev yourself, and it would be tied to um, GitLab SaaS in, in a similar way to how the observability stack is. Um, but I, I I think both Jitsu and Cube Dev are problematic in the sense that like without a ton of work, neither of them are going to be like able to be run in like a multi-tenant SaaS fashion. Um, and I'd also like to see like, again, more collaboration between what product analytics is doing and, and what um, the monitor uh, team is working on, because they seem like very similar problems from my perspective. Thanks for the links, Andrew. And I think the, um, it's Tim, uh, what's his name? Does anybody remember the DRI for that stuff? Tim Zolman, I think. Yeah, that's right, for product analytics. Yeah. Yeah, specifically, like I, I don't think we need cube.dev when we have our own um, fork of Grafana going, right? Because I, I, I see the fork of Grafana turning into like a more general purpose like dashboarding solution, and that seems to be what cube dev does. So it would be a shame if we end up with two like distinct dashboarding solutions as part of the product. But at, all this to say, I think this is this is why we need. Um, a more robust blueprint process because like this sort of collaboration is very difficult, especially when both teams are like very early stage in, in, in development. It's very easy for like people to run with separate stacks when there's opportunity to collaborate or converge on a single stack, I think. And uh, <clears throat> on to number four, we, we had this uh, MR out for a while. I, um, I resolved a couple of threads with to do's actions for me to go back and fix. I saw that Eric had some feedback shortly after I uh, merged, so I'll address that after this meeting. Um, but I wanted to make sure that the exit criteria was up to date based on what we've discussed in the last couple of meetings. This, this MR was like three weeks old, so it needed to get out the door. Yeah, I, I believe the, the exit criteria are, are really great. I just wonder what can we do to move uh, forward towards actually, you know, getting them done in, with a bit better pace somehow. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm sometimes missing from this working group is a clear set of action points assigned to uh, working group team members after every meeting so that I could actually vol volunteer to do, do a bit more work so that we can move towards the exit criteria a bit faster. Yeah, I think that's a great question. It's really easy to just um, like I have found myself getting distracted by like just writing more blueprints or or working on additional blueprints. Um, but obviously, that just keeps pushing the the goalpost further away. Um, I think we we really need to pin down like a f more formal definition of what a blueprint is, right? Um, as we've talked about in previous discussions, um, just for um, 
the sake of reiterating, I, I do have this project that I've been working on um, that has like a proposed template for a blueprint. Let me link it here, sorry. That's what I was gonna suggest is like, a, I think a template is the way to make an, like an artifact deliverable to describe what something is. And then it, it gives people a huge head start. And, yeah, and I, I think also by defining the template, it almost seems like we're doing it before we really know what you're doing, but by defining it, it'll actually help us to, to understand what we want. Like it'll bring that out. Um, so we can almost do those two things in parallel. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. And, if, uh, I also wonder if, uh, I, I think that template is great, but we do have a bunch of blueprints written already and we can, based on the historical evidence describe what usually should be inside a blueprint and perhaps this mm -hmm. description somewhere uh, or like before uh, describing a template could also help people to actually um, uh, figure it out what should be in there. Yeah, and I, yeah, I think like a, yeah, good description of what it is and then take the best blueprints from the past and, and look for the common elements and then there's V1 of the template and then it's, you know, as long as we're flexible about the template, then exactly what Andrew and Marshall described sort of emerges, which is a, you know, a really solid outline. Yeah, and I think that spreadsheet that we put together is really useful because it, it links you to both the blueprint and the production readiness review and when it existed, the AppSec review. Um, and if we have the ambition to to start to consolidate some of those um, some of that documentation into a single document, which is what I think a blueprint should end up being, um, it's worth taking note of like what we documented in a PRR that was separate from what we documented in the original blueprint, and making sure that like our template has the sections uh, necessary to describe the level of detail required for a production readiness review. And, and like, I think another thing that we need to be like, because like, if you look at this template that I've defined, it it feels quite verbose, right? And if we are trying to get people to use the blueprint process more often, it's going to be a bit overwhelming. So I think we need to be clear that like, the we need to make sure that folks understand that the process is iterative, right? Like, you don't need to have a complete blueprint in order to get it merged. Um, it's it's just there to help guide you through the process, right? So you're not going to be ready for a production readiness review up front. So you wouldn't expect to have that section um, completed when you're initially designing something. Um, but it's it's there to handhold you through the process once you get to that step. I added an action point for myself to document uh, what a blueprint is and uh, to also link a bunch of uh, existing blueprints from our handbook. I'm going to add that blueprint or the um, spreadsheet link to the top of this document too. So, that it's always so, so that's lowering the entry barrier. What what about um, leveraging the cross prioritization framework? Is there something we can do to uh, move towards this exit? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> another another great question. Um, the first first step from my perspective is uh, understanding the current state of that initiative because it's been a while since I participated in any of the working groups or any of the AMAs. Um, so I'll take that as an action for myself as well. Um, Perhaps you could put together a summary of like uh, for the rest of us, because I don't know where that is either. And and yeah, I I had I was lucky enough to meet Fabian in person the other week, and we were talking about this a, a bit as well. Um, and he he explained it better than anyone else. Do you have any insight into that, Fabian? <laughs> oh, you're putting me on the spot now. I was reading something else, so uh -oh. I could actually tell you know a grand story but i actually didn't listen so can you repeat this please yeah i was just saying that like um you seemed more knowledgeable than most regarding the next prioritization or cross prioritization framework and i was wondering if you could like summarize that for the rest of our sakes uh that's high praise my understanding <laughs> is that what it is trying to accomplish is that the members of the quad 
which is the engineering manager, the pro manager, the product manager, um, and quality, um, you know, are better able to prioritize immediate things by collaborating more actively with each other through a very elaborate process um, that um, I think I've not adhered to particularly well. Um, but the intent is to essentially foster collaboration um, and make sure that, for example, like you know, I take on the like product responsibility here. I'll come in as the PM for a group and say like we need these five feature improvements, and that comes at the complete expense of not addressing any bugs or technical debt. And so this should give us an opportunity to essentially say, okay, these are the types of issues that are um, are being prioritized for a milestone, they can be parsed out by actually applying specific labels like type feature, maintenance, and so on and so forth. And then observing sort of the distribution and saying the pods data, the pods team right now is focused mainly on maintenance tasks. And I think it has evolved a little bit to the point, as far as I understand, that rather than enforcing strict percentages, saying that like you need 70% feature work and 10% this work, it takes into account that you know, teams vary, right? So I think we're at the point where, at least the way I understand it, it's mostly you can look at these data and can say, okay, we're focusing mostly on feature work right now. Uh, is everybody okay with that, right? Are we making the right priority calls? That's how I understand it. Also has, I think, included a fair amount of box ticking and things like this. So I, I'm not sure if that has changed. In the is, last isn't, that, isn't that exactly how it used to work before? Can, I think that the difference now is there's. Deny I think the difference is there's an explicit guidance, like about what the suggested, you know, pie chart should look like. So there's a framework for the the engineering side and the development side to advocate for allocating more more resources to maintenance work or technical debt or whatever. And I think what Eric had said in the previous meetings is that's also as he sees it a framework for us to say, okay, for these larger cross organizational initiatives, we can say, well, across all of these groups, we have this amount of, you know, capacity for maintenance. We can pull that and use it to advocate for these larger, uh, efforts yeah i think that's fair and uh, like my, this is not my personal take on it but so take it as a personal opinion i think having more data is valuable right as in being able to say across the organization or within your team these are the focuses and i think that can help us make better decisions um i think we're actually moving into the direction that chad is pointing out where this is a framework when right, that makes these more explicit and can actually help um, I don't necessarily think this is the only way of doing it or the right way or you, uh, I think that teams work in different ways and some teams may benefit from, you know, this more than others, but I think it is fair that, you know, if anybody came into your team and said, hey, you know, like, why are these things not being addressed, that everybody is able to provide sort of the context and say, well, we're not doing this because we're doing that and these are the reasons for it, right? And so it, that's kind of what right. it is. And I think just just the, in my experience, the act of having those discussions, like, is this a bug? Is it a feature? Is it a uh, chore, maintenance, whatever you call that technical debt, is valuable because in, in an agile environment, in my experience, there's some things that are clear and there's others that are vague. Like, for example, on the editor team, like we're developing a lot of new work on the content editor, on the web IDE. So, if there's a small problem in that or all of the infrastructure that I'm making to support able to uh, develop new WYSIWYG markdown, is that feature work or is it maintenance work? I call it feature work because it's ultimately supporting user-facing value. And if there's, you know, we're moving fast and iterating, if there is something wrong with it, is it a bug? No, it's, it's, it's still part of a feature, especially if it's not if it's not live yet, right? It's all still in development. So that just having those discussions is important to get product and engineering on the same page. What is the future, what is not? Yeah, it, it, I think like in summary, it, it 
it seems like a lot of the mechanisms that I thought that we would um, leverage have sort of been like r rolled back a bit. Um, so I, I, I don't think that it's like a, a framework that is immediately obvious how we would hook the blueprint process into anymore. Uh, I think we have a lot on our end to define um, in order to, 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 to bridge that gap. I, I, I think in many ways we're going to be like defining how cross-functional efforts get prioritized rather than like hooking into something that's going to allow us to yeah, prioritize I, I, them more. I easily. think if, 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 if maybe that's actually the, the uh, crux of the problem here, because from my perspective and from like past experiences, the, the major challenge here is to evaluate the relative, relative priority of all the far reaching work or like complex blueprint related work, architectural work to other things that are going to be uh, processed through the cross prioritization framework. And um, it, it's very, very difficult to do that. I wonder how bigger companies oh. are actually solving that. Are they having the, like, I know that product has the opportunity canvas investment cases. I wonder if we need a similar process to actually evaluate the priority of uh, architectural changes and uh, the, to calculate red round investment so that then we can put it into the perspective when the cross-functional prioritization happens. Yeah, this is actually something that Fabian and I discussed in, in person a bit, which is like, um, maybe some of that also makes sense to be part of the, the blueprint documentation. And, and I understand that like stuff like, um, I, think, I think everything that we put in an opportunity canvas today is essentially public information. There's no reason to hide that, but there is slightly more sensitive information in the form of like investment cases and stuff, like when it comes down to um, where the money's going or, or how much we intend to make and the impacts to ARR and stuff like that. Um, so I'm not sure like how to marry those two things together, but I certainly would love to see like a, a, a process that works for everybody here, right? Because I, I, I find the opportunity canvases and frankly, a lot of documentation that is produced uh, to, to, to be like opaque from an engineering perspective. Like I see a lot of like user sessions and recordings and in, in dovetail. And up until like a couple of weeks ago, I didn't even know that I had access to that stuff. Um, it, it, Product produces so much documentation though. Like how do you distill like a bunch of user studies into a markdown document, right? I don't, I don't know what the answer is there, but I, I think there's 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 gotta be a middle ground where the information is more accessible to to both parties, I think. Yeah. Well, I think, I think like a couple of thoughts and um, I think on the one hand, the, I think it's sort of traditionally, and I think this is not wrong, right? The, the product organization tries to answer maybe more as like what we should do and why we should do it based on the market, but we're not so concerned necessarily with the implementation of, of this, right? But I think we've reached a scale where making a, like if you have a, an opportunity within your group, let's say something smaller, right? Then that's not so relevant because you can talk to your team, right? And you can make choices and that's, I think, okay, usually. And this is also where this next prioritization framework is sort of practiced. I think it's on the sort of the group unit where this becomes more tricky is when you have larger opportunities, right? Where it becomes a question that's like, I don't know, you know, where you need to make bigger changes. And if you have that higher level sort of product intent, you have to answer pretty quickly. It's like what architecture requirements actually follow from this. And I think that is maybe something where we we struggle sometimes because you can't really sort of completely decouple them. Right? And I think this is this is something where I think this is really interesting. And I have some again uh, perspective from from the past experience here. I, I wonder would it be a viable solution to write a blueprint and then just give it to a group product manager to evaluate return of investment, run this option canvas process, or because this is what we did, for example, for the CI scaling partitioning stuff, right? We had, we've had like, we had had 
six months of discussions until actually a group product manager took the blueprint and moved that through the process of the, this like you know planning calculating asking a lot of difficult questions about why do we need to do that what's the return of investment perhaps this is an, this opportunity to collaborate closely with product team members so that we together can repurpose the processes that product team has to actually evaluate the relative priority of, of architectural work maybe yes um i i think it's uh, I um, like I, I think what is is clear to me at least is that you know the you know product and engineering cannot propose separate things that are not related to each other. Then like progress this one thing very far and then sort of move it to the other side and say hey you know like let's do this it's really important or vice versa right and I think earlier collaboration and alignment. And the process that facilitates that can help a lot. I think yeah. Marshall and I also talked about mm -hmm. this, where you can think of this also in two different directions, right? I think anybody being able to make a blueprint, I think, is a great way to facilitate feedback from the bottom up, right? Yeah. People who are on the ground who have really, like you were experiencing this, right? Andrew losing half of his hair because some parts of working with the co-face are terrible, right? But then you also have these higher, higher level initiatives where maybe product and engineering leadership are coming saying like this is something that's really important on a sort of strategic level right and i think both are valid avenues and i think we need to account for them otherwise we yeah. lose that, out i think value. that's i think that's what the the next prioritization is trying to make that happen in a healthy way on on the groups where it may not happen for whatever reason for example an editor it, it happens very organically that the remote development work is very technical, very architectural. And Eric, our PM, is deeply involved in those discussions and the feedback loops are tight and healthy. And the engineering, you know, David is, is very involved in it. And Eric is, you know, our conduit to the highest levels to what Sid wants. What are the product priorities and how does that affect the architectural decisions that are being made? So I think that's you know, that is the point of the next prioritization group to help more groups that may be newer or different levels of experience in product manager and engineering to have that same sort of healthy type feedback loops. Yeah, I also I also think that like we want to be careful to like going back to what you said, Gershigor, like it we we, we I don't think we want to think of this as like, you know, here's my blueprint product manager please write an investment case for it so that i can get it prioritized right because that's no different from a product manager saying here's an investment case engineer please go write the architectural blueprint for it right yeah, i feel like, like those things should happen in parallel like so it, it should be collaboration and the, the, yeah. the architecture evolution workflow is a collaborative process and uh, I, and i just think i i, I think we content. should consider we should consider both equally valid entry points into the blueprint process right it can it can start with a with a um uh investment case just as well as it could start with a architectural blueprint depending on who's coming at it and what problem they're 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 trying to solve right so i think i think it should very much be a process that works for everybody and like the validity of whether we continue iter iterating on it and, and collaborating on it should be defined by like what it is, not like who created it, you know? Um, Cause ultimately like the, the why should be the same. It's just the who and, and what expertise they're starting with that, that, that that's different, right? So perhaps what we're missing uh, in, in handbook in the process is to actually describe this relationship between uh, between writing a engineers writing a blueprint, collaborating with a product manager. Uh, another challenge is actually finding a product manager. That that was the problem with GraphQL blueprint. Then we had a product manager changing like three times, and uh, eventually, like this, this lack of good collaboration resulted in us not doing much with, with that blueprint. I believe. I have to hop in a couple of minutes um, and at the risk of making this even more opaque, but have we actually, do we have examples where we feel 
a product manager and engineers have collaborated in a way that we believe worked out well and captured why. Yes, the composition. That's my example. That's that's exactly great example of how I, where, it, where it worked very well. It's yeah, this was this all started a, just a bit before my time, but I think the container registry migration was also a pretty good example. Yeah. So maybe an action item to take is to look at this a little bit more in detail and ask you know folks is like what made this a success? You know what? Why do you think this worked out? You know what are the, some of the downsides and upsides and then see what comes back uh, because I think maybe that is what we can use as data to make that a little bit more um, sort of broadly applicable. Um, I do want to cite Dylan here in a one-on-one -on -one yesterday that we had and uh, sorry um, I at least from my experience you know working with a variety of folks Dylan said one of the biggest things is to actually build relationships with people and have that and I don't think our processes usually capture that very well. And I think this is something that maybe we have to take into account a little bit more that this is not a fluffy exercise of, you know, like everybody uh, needs to have lots of coffee chats, but really working on, on you know, making sure that these interfaces yeah. work well. That's yeah. Yeah. Minimizing feedback loops. That's the essence of Agile, like tight feedback loops at every level, macro and micro. In case of our architecture evolution workflow, that's also the role of architecture evolution coach. So because this person not only can help with describing the technical direction, but should already have some connections in the company to make it easier to uh, strengthen, amplify this influence that NG, NG want to have through creating a blueprint. I have to hop off. Um, yes, thank you. See you guys next week.